All right, section one, I know this isn't the best video and that's a nice hole and a nice stain up on the ceiling, but the important part is that you can hear me. All right, so um, this particular exam is on chapter seven, eight, nine, and 10. If you'll remember back, chapter seven was when we talked about uh, digital short messages. We talked a lot about uh, email and memos and those types of things. And then chapter eight, nine, and 10 is where we really started getting into specific types of messages. And so chapter eight was all about positive messages. We know that's what we're gonna write the most in the workforce. In the workforce, we're gonna do positive messages. Talked about all kinds of different types of positive messages that we can write and did some examples. Chapter nine, we tweaked it a little bit and talked about negative messages. And then just past this past week, we did chapter 10, which was all about persuasion and being able to persuade someone to buy something we want or do something we wanted them to do or join a fitness thing. We talked about the county doing that. So seven, eight, nine, and 10 is what the exam is going to be on. It's uh, again, 60 questions, multiple choice. Um, probably the biggest question I always get at the beginning uh, before we do an exam and it'll come up every exam is that students want to know how much grammar. So it's not a lot of grammar. If we've not done it in class activities, or if you've not had it in a chapter assignment, they're really not going to ask you. It's very much like what we did before. Uh, you may have to identify which is the following, which, which sentence are they using the best for a dependent clause, you know, or hiding the negative in a dependent clause or something <laughs> like that. So you may have to identify that, which of the following is the best use of passive voice. So something like that, but it is not going to be anything like your Canvas quizzes or your grammar mechanics quizzes. It's not gonna be grammar heavy like that. It, it never is. Um, so 60 questions. Um, you'll have the full class time, uh, an hour and 15 minutes to complete it. And um, all right, without any further ado, let's talk about some of the things that we've talked about over the last four chapters. Uh, talked a lot about uh, text messaging in chapter seven and instant messaging. And um, uh, we specifically talked a little bit about the fact that uh, we have to be very careful what we put in instant messages and what we put in uh, text messaging because what could happen with what we write in those things? They could be used later for what? Court. For court, right? And so you got to be careful. They can be used for court. They can be used for lawsuits. Um, we know that businesses uh, use a lot of social networking sites uh, today, such as Twitter, such as Instagram, such as Facebook, uh, to connect with different um, uh, customers and uh, different companies and to exchange ideas. Uh, it's not just a platform anymore for just having fun and just being sociable. Businesses learned uh, a little while ago that this is a place to capitalize and to get on and to promote things and to sell things. So definitely social media is being used as a platform uh, in that way now. Um, we also know that uh, <laughs> Texting and instant messaging, we talked a lot. It's, it's a, a tool that's being used for marketing. People are out there using Instagram, they're using Twitter to sell things and to put things out there on the market. Um, let's see. What are some things that we know about communication when uh, we're in this digital age now that we're in, right? And we're communicating uh, with these tools of the digital age and on social media and what have you. So what are some of the key things that we're seeing with um, communication on uh, in the digital age? Like for instance, we know for sure um, that a lot of messages happen now are a lot shorter than what they would have been in years past, right? So they're shorter, they're more frequent, what else? They're quicker, they're speedier. Mm -hmm. The response time is a lot faster. That's a good one. What else? How about this? That we're doing a lot more. We're, we're moving away from the typical uh, computer there at your desk and a lot more is happening, happening here on mobile devices. It's quicker, it's easier. Um, we're seeing it here on the phone. We're also seeing it on, um, when we say mobile devices, it could be our iPad, you know, or what have you. Uh, so uh, all of those things are happening in the digital age with our communication faster, uh, it's shorter, it's more frequent, response is quicker, um, we, we can do it via mobile devices, all of those things uh, are a part. Um, 
what type, and they keep, I, they love this question, but what type of communication happens most frequently? What type of message is the, the biggest type of message that is sent in the business world today? Email. Email. They love coming back to that question. I don't know why, but they just want to make sure that you know that, I guess. Um, and I guess because we went through it again in chapter seven. Um, let's talk about when we would send, uh, um, when it would be appropriate to send an email message versus when it would not. So when would we send an email message and when would it not be a good idea to send an email message? When it, to a lot of when it has to go to a lot of people, it's a good idea to send an email because we can, we can save time. Um, what type of stuff would we not want to put in an email? Would we want to fire someone in an email? No, we wouldn't want to fire anyone in an email. What other kind of things would we not want to put in an email? Yeah, like something that would be strong, like that they would be hostile about, you know, maybe might would want to do that more face to face face. But I'm thinking about more of the content that we might not would be comfortable sending via email. So we wouldn't want to fire someone via email. Um, we wouldn't want to, you know, talk about something in a serious nature like them being put on suspension from work or probation from work. We also wouldn't want to share a lot of salary information via email because remember it's not always um that's why a lot of times we, we want to put things in uh, an actual written business because it's what business letters are a lot more what <clears throat> they're a lot more formal and they're also good for what they're more protected it's good for keeping yeah it's good for keeping record and so probably an email not a good thing for like sending important information that you wouldn't want to get out you know um, because as much as we think oh they're the only one that's going to see that email people can get to that email people can see things over your shoulder uh, those kind of things um what would you say is the most important part of an email we we talked about it uh, just very briefly they really don't give you a lot of activities and make you practice writing these. Um, I mean, it's part of the longer writings that we've done and things that we fixed and we've looked at them. But if what, given how uh, inundated we are with e email and overwhelmed we are with email and knowing that people usually check email only at a certain time. Getting to the point. Getting to the point is very important, but so the subject line is what's really going to grab someone's attention to let them know if they even want to check into that email at that time. Um, you're going to have a few questions that are um, more application questions in that um, not only are they gonna, they're gonna wanna test you, like they're gonna say, which of the following is a good subject line, okay? And so you're looking for something that's not too broad out there, but not something that's too small. You know, you, you want it right there in the middle. Um, we talked a lot in chapter seven uh, about the importance of controlling our email box. And what were some of the things that we talked about that could help us with that? when we talked about how overwhelming, we know emails are the way to go. That's what most people do is they send emails. And we said, it can literally drive people insane checking all of this email. And so we said, what are some things that we can do to kind of alleviate that? Check it at the same time every day, set specific times. And that may be one specific time in a day or two specific times in a day. Some people feel, feel like they have to do it in three checks, but do it at a set time. That's a great thing. That's one of the key things. What else? That was one of the main things that we talked about. We also talked about downloading could kind of help, you know, you could download and kind of use what was sent and this just kind of put in a different color, your answers to that and send it back. Um, we also talked about that, um, uh, oh, the phrase just slipped my head. But it's like you can see if you could answer it and reply very quickly, like within five minutes, then you could do those quickly and then save the rest for the afternoon kind of thing. Um, so all of those are good methods to help us with it, but you got the key point there. Um, when would we opt for a memo instead of an email? We talked about 
some of the ways they were very uh, similar and some of the things they in their job that they do they're very similar but when would we say a lot of times we're gonna opt for email because that's what we do most commonly but when would we say okay a memo is necessary for that what kind of things could spark that Um, okay, so maybe if there's instructions, but we could put a set of instructions in an email. Maybe, yeah. I'm thinking more length. Like if it's just crazy long, right, we would want to put that in a memo, not an email. We don't want to make emails very lengthy and too wordy, right? So if it gets past a certain thing, we want to switch to a memo as opposed to um, an email. Um, but we did talk about ways that they're similar. They, they both have kind of the same, they're gonna have an opening, they're gonna have a body, they're gonna have a closing. Um, they're, um, they're, they're very similar in that way. So the emails and memos both generally close with an action, like what they want you to do uh, and information and dates or deadlines. They both ha are a summary of um, the message and a closing thought. So they both end the exact same way. Um, Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, etiquette for texting. And so what's one of the things that, what are some of the things we talked about having good texting etiquette? Um, what would, were some of the things that came up in discussion about that? Shorthand, like don't. Yeah, don't use all these crazy abbreviations, especially if we're communicating uh, via business, like, you know, and not with just a personal friend. What else? No slang. No slang, that's a good one. The time frame, that's an excellent one. So if we wouldn't call someone at that time, if it's crazy late, like, oh, it's midnight, I wouldn't call them because it's too late. Oh, it's okay, I'll text. Generally, the practice to keep is if it's too late or too early to call, it's too late or too early to text. Um, I looked at this, but it's always hard to know how to just... Um, in today's world, in this, uh, in this uh, digital era that we're in, uh, there's a lot of things that we have to kind of um, accept, I guess. Um, and so, and then there's things that aren't the case. So like when uh, talking about uh, Twitter, podcast, wikis, which we talked very little about, um, uh, Let's just say this, the internet has empowered people in general. So whether you're a manager or you're a consumer or you are, um, no matter where you are, you know, in this uh, world, whether you're a colleague or you're, um, like I said, you're under someone or you're above someone supervising, all of us because of the internet have power to create things to put on the internet. So it doesn't matter our position. We all have that same ability that we can utilize the web and use it to our advantage and we can um, put things up uh, and create our own web uh, content. We can blog, we can vlog now. We can uh, contribute to <coughs> wikis and be a part of adding information to things like Wikipedia. And so it's opened up this vast world where anybody can contribute and be a part of the World Wide Web. Um, we didn't do a lot of talking about blogs, but there are a couple of questions, at least one question about blogs. Um, uh, some of the things that are good about blogs is that it's really good at inviting uh, consumer feedback. So um, it's a great way for uh, people to talk back and forth, consumers to talk back and forth and participate in uh, focus groups or surveys or whatever the case may be. Um, all right, so we're kind of transitioning now. Uh, uh, 
business letters, the word I was looking for earlier, we talked about when would we opt for an actual uh, business letter when we want to be more formal, when we want to be confidential, and when we need proof that someone received it, right? When we want to actually be able to say, no, somebody signed, you signed for this letter, we know that you received it. So some, those are some of the instances when uh, we would uh, want to um, use a business letter. Um, Uh, can a business um, in a professional be taken to court by something they say online? Are they held liable for something that they post online? Yes, they absolutely are. Um, most of the writing that we do um, in the workplace, we've talked about positive writing, we've talked about negative writing, and we've talked about persuasive writing. Um, which one of those are we going to find that we use more often? Positive. positive, yeah. Now we are seeing an upswing where we're doing more and more persuasive. We talked about that last um, uh, last week because they are creating this more unilateral workforce. Remember we talked about that. They're trying not to be like, okay, we're up here in upper management and you're down there. They're trying to make it this level playing field. And when they try to level the playing field, then it doesn't work as often just speaking directly to. Now we're trying to get everybody on board, so to speak, you know, and so we use the persuasive. But as for now, a pro, the um, positive messages are probably what you would find yourself writing more, more than not in uh, the workforce. Mm. All right, so we talk a lot about that three by three writing process. And so um, what's one of the first things that we, bef before we ever start preparing a message, whether it's positive, whether it's negative, whether it's persuasive, what are some of the first questions that we ask ourselves? What's like the very first thing um, that you should ask before you put something to, whether it's to email or to a business letter or, or a memo, before I ever write anything, what's the first thing I should probably ask myself? Who's my audience? Who's my audience is a great one. That's not gonna be one of your options, but that's a good one. But even before I talk about my audience, what's the first thing that I'm gonna ask? That's always the first part, Brandy, of that. Uh, analyzing is always that first part of three by three. But even before I do that, I ask myself what? Message I want to convey. What message do I want to convey? And if I even... And the form that they use. Yes, all of these. You guys are nailing that first one. Um, and this would be, um, but even before I pick my channel, uh, even before I, I do any of that, my first thought is, do I even need to be writing this? Right, yeah. we've talked about that. We don't need to waste people's time. As if, if it's not something that actually needs to be put into uh, writing, then there is no sense in, in, in writing it. Once we make that decision, yes, this is something I need to, then we start doing all of those things that we were talking about in that analyzing. We pick our correct channel, we uh, analyze our audience. Uh, we talk about all of those things that you guys were just talking about. But even before that, we have to decide, you know, do I really even need to uh, do this? Um, you're going to have an application one where it says Will's decided to write a letter and then it's going to ask you uh, what should be the first thing that he does and it's going to give you a list of things and that should be pretty obvious to you guys which thing he should do first. Um, you're going to have a couple of questions where they ask you um, for which of the following situations would a business letter be more appropriate than an email and vice versa? Which of the following should an email, would an email be better? So remember, what are the kind of things you're looking at? Do, you, do, I, do I need it to be confidential? Is it something that I need a signature for? So those are the things that you know business letters are more appropriate for when it's confidential information. With a business letter, you can get a signature? With a business letter, you can get a signature, so you know that it's not been intercepted. With a business letter, it's more confidential. Um, a business letter is more formal, right? But then we talked about some of the things that are better about um, a, an email, right? So an email um, is better for like um, uh, being quick and more short and to the point when I have to send to multiple people, you know, or a lot of people. Uh, you have another application one. Um, when we are... Uh, in that organization time, when we're in that second phase of the three by three writing process, and um, don't let me get lost in the time, guys, like I did that one time. 
uh, when we're in that three by three writing phase, and now we're actually drafting and we're organizing. When we are actually thinking about the use of, okay, I need to use headings, I need to use bullet points, I need to uh, have a good use of my white space. I'm doing all of that to do what? Is that to help me? No, it's to do what? Make it easier for the reader. Yes, it's to help the reader. It's to make it easier for the reader. It's to save them time so they're not looking through for those details. It's pulling those details out in bulleted points. It's making it easier to read because of those wonderful margins and for the use of the white space. So that's not about me. It's all about making it easier, easier for the audience and helping them to save time. Um, Uh, what type of strategy, we talked about two types of strategy, direct and indirect, which one do I use most of the time? Which one are we going to find that we use most of the time? Direct, direct strategy. Uh, it's usually the strongest, the majority of our business writing and messages are going to be in direct um, because that's just the best way to go. Direct strategy is what we like in business writing. It's short, sweet, hard to beat, we get to the point. There's no beating around the bush, so to speak. Now, there are going to be times when we do want to use indirect. What are some of those times? I'm sorry, when you have to fire someone, yeah. So when we're trying to soften the blow, uh, when we're not sure how the audience will respond sometimes, I mean, they may not respond negatively, but if we don't know for sure, sometimes we'll use indirect. If we think the audience would become hostile, if we think it's going to be a big blow personally to someone and really affect them personally, all of those reasons we would pull out an indirect strategy. Um, we always want to, I think either uh, Brandy or maybe it was Carolina that mentioned this while ago, it's always important to put um, um, all of our important information first, like we lead with that indirect strategy and we make sure we put that in important information uh, first. <laughs> and so they're going to ask you, look at the following examples, which one is doing that, okay? Which one is putting that information first like, uh, like it should be? Um, they have a couple of questions. I want to say two questions at least like this, maybe three even, uh, where uh, they ask you, maybe not, maybe it's only one or two, uh, where they ask you specifically, um, uh, look at the following, which of the following is a command and it's uh, being kind of um, disguised as a polite request, but it's an actual command. Like they want you to do this, but they do it in a nice and kind way. So which of the following? So you've got a few that are like that where they're just giving you examples other than just giving you the answer, there's not much that I can do for you with that one, but just to know the type of question that you're going to have. Um, okay, so uh, when we were talking about positive forms of messages, one of those was what we called a direct claim. So this is when a consumer or someone just comes right out and asks for, uh, they're, they're very straightforward. So um, uh, just know that a straightforward claim should always open with, um, uh, with a very clear statement of the problem. Um, and or and or the action that you're wanting that receiver to take. So what is it that you're wanting? Are you wanting a gate fixed? Are you uh, wanting money back? Are you, you know, whatever that case may be, but it should be, uh, we should open a direct claim with that clear statement of what the problem is and what we're expecting them to do. Um. <coughs> We didn't talk a lot about apologizing. You got to be careful a lot of time in today's world about um, apologizing. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, is that people do like to hear apologies. It's kind of like a psychological compensation for them. Um, so just know that that people like to hear uh, apologies. Um, they feel like it it makes the other person seem uh, more humble and and have some sort of humility in them. Um, when you are sending what we would call a goodwill message it's very important that um and remember it talked about like the five ways it had five different things it was like a 
on the PowerPoint that we did, it was like five ways to make sure you're sending a goodwill uh, message. But the most important thing when we're sending goodwill messages is to make sure that we're sincere, right? Um, you have a lot, again, some more um, application type things where it says, um, uh, uh, where they're checking if you know um, those phases. What's phase one? Pre-writing. What's phase two? Organizing and drafting. What's phase three? Revising. Revising. And so they'll have a few things like, um, Michelle has just finished this. What, what stage of the writing process did she finish? Or Michelle has just finished this stage. What would be the next stage that she would move on to? So they do it in a couple of different ways without just coming out and saying, what is phase one? What is phase two? They're going to ask you in some applicable ways, but that's what they're testing you on is making sure that you remember those um, phases and what should happen first, second, and third kind of thing. Um, they do, I told you when we were going over it, they do ask you uh, a number of different, and we're halfway there guys, a number of different questions regarding uh, being liable in lawsuits. I told you they had two or three questions about that. So you need to know, um, know the definition of uh, actionable. So I'm just going to tell you that. You guys can look that back up. But you need to know the defini definition of actionable. All right, so moving on now to negative messages. Um, uh, what are some of the things that we know about um, negative messages? So... Um, be careful when you give negative messages. Remember we talked about how um, your words a lot of times can be um, confused with the words or they represent the words of the organization. So you need to talk like the organization would talk. Even if it's not your specific thoughts or opinions, when you represent the organization, you need to speak in a way that represents how the organization feels about a specific topic. Not the way you feel about the topic necessarily, but the way the organization feels uh, about the topic. Um, direct strategy uh, should be used to communicate negative. We talked a lot about when we use indirect strategy, it's typically for um, negative, but when would we not use indirect strategy for a negative message? When would we just go back to that direct strategy. There's a couple different times that we would do that. When would we just go back to direct strategy even though it's a negative message? When we know that person, that was one of the exact things that we talked about, when we know that the person specifically prefers uh, direct strategy, don't him haul around with me, you know, you know that's what your manager or what a colleague likes and so you know that they, they don't want indirect strategy. Um, sometimes we need to use direct strategy to tell someone no because they need to know no is no, right? We need to be firm. And really, firmness doesn't come through in indirect strategy. Um, so sometimes we're implying, remember? Sometimes we're hiding it in those subordinating, uh, those dependent clauses with those subordinating conjunctions. And sometimes it's not good enough just to hide it or imply it. Sometimes we need to be very firm. So if we need firmness, then we would need to use direct strategy. We need to use it when that other person knows that they're doing it or when we know that the people don't care. They don't care about the, the negative news. Then we could use direct strategy there as well. Um, uh, when do we, uh, we've already talked about that when we use indirect strategy. I'm not gonna keep beating that horse. Uh, I think we've kind of hit that quite a bit. Um, a lot of people, I say a lot of people, there's always a couple in each class. When we start discussing indirect strategy and we start talking about, I use the phrase up here a lot, uh, putting kale in your brownies for your kids. Like they feel like, like how many parents would feel like that's a little bit dishonest, like that I'm not telling them, right? Um, most of us would say, you know, they, it's not going to hurt them. It's in there, you know, kind of thing. But a lot of people feel like indirect strategy can come across as a little unethical, right? They feel like... Um, uh, if you're not careful and you don't use indirect strategy the right way, then you're kind of crossing boundaries, you know, as uh, what's ethical and what's not ethical. Um, so, um, in that, you have a question that asks, what is the most accurate statement? And they give you several, uh, four statements uh, about keeping indirect strategy very ethical. And so uh, one of those statements is, when you use the indirect strategy, your motives are to deceive the reader and to hide the news. 
obviously that's not the case, right? And so some of them are going to uh, be very uh, clear like that to you. Uh, but we do, uh, the one should become very obvious to you which one it is, right? We don't, there's certain ways like that, we don't want to cross that line. Using indirect strategy is not unethical, but you can use it in such a way that it would cross that line. So they're going to ask you to pick uh, which one is, which statement is most accurate about keeping it ethical. Um, okay, we talked a lot about buffers. What's a buffer? <laughs> like a cushion. Um, there's a lot of different kinds of buffers that we talked about. Um, what kinds did we talk about? A compliment. What else? Um, praising them, a compliment. Um, we talked about like how kids react and respond and how we would do it. But it's basically just there to kind of be a cushion to kind of reduce the shock that the person receiving the message is going to uh, receive. We want to kind of cushion them from that. Um, and then they are going to ask you which of the following is a good buffer, which is a, an example of an effective buffer. And they're gonna give you a few examples for that. Um, and another question about buffers, select the best buffer. So th at least three questions there about buffer. One's more definitional, the other two are more, look at these, which would you consider a good buffer? Um, okay, so I told you that there would be a couple on here about, um, which of the following is using passive voice. So just remember the difference between active and passive. Remember that active voice is when the subject is actually performing the action, all right? Passive is the reverse of that. And so um, you'll need to go back and brush up on, and we did a few activities with active and passive voice, so you'll have to identify which of the following is using uh, passive. Um, you're also, um, and this is as grammarly as it gets for the test, you're also going to have to um, look and identify which of the following has placed uh, uh, negative news or bad news in a subordinating clause. And again, we had that as one of our activities where you guys had to go in and actually write it as a, subor um, a subordinate clause, as a, in a dependent clause and hide that negative news in there. So in this case, you're not having to write it, but you have to identify out of the four which one is doing that. Um, you also have to look at the example. So all of these are going back to those activities that we did. I wanna say it was 9.1 through 9.4 that we did, um, but this is going back, so you might wanna look at that and review that. But um, the next question is, which of the following is implying the negative news? So we did all of that in 9.1, <coughs> 9.2, 9.3, 9.4. .9 so they're asking you, look which one's using passive voice, look which one's using an independent clause and a subordinating clause to put the negative news. Okay, which of the following is using implication, they're implying instead of just stating it, the, the refusal. Um, so they're gonna ask you um, about all of those, at least three questions that it looks like that are that way. Um, if you're not sure how your reader is gonna respond, is it best to err on the side of direct strategy or indirect strategy? I mean, we know that direct strategy is what we typically write with, but if we don't know how our audience is going to react, then which one should you do? Indirect. Uh, uh, they ask you, so we talked about uh, what a direct claim was, and so that's when we put forth, hey, there's an issue, I'm going to need my money back, or you guys gave me this product, it's no longer working, and we make this direct claim. Uh, we actually used the example of my son when he ordered his hat, he got his hat, it was squished, and so his direct claim was, I just received my hat, it's not you know, in the right shape it's supposed to be, and what can you do kind of thing for me. So when we can, in a positive way, say, sure, we can do something for you, that's what we call an adjustment, right? And so um, if we can do it in a positive way. But there are times when we can't. Uh, maybe it's out of our hands, like we can't refund the money. We have a company policy that says we can't refund money. So whenever we are giving a de denying a claim, so a direct claim has come, but we have to deny it, um, they're going to give you, here are uh, four examples or five examples, which one does the most effective job at denying that claim in the right way, okay? So we know about those, but you're going to actually have to look at some examples and say which one does the best job at denying a claim. Um, I think that one you'll be fine. Um, you're going to need to uh, go back and look. Now, I already told you that you needed to know what was the first one I told you you needed to know about, the, the definition that you had to go back. 
actionable. So you're also going to need to make sure that you know the definition of actionable, know the definition of libel when it's different from defamation. So know those three defini de definitions, libel, defamation, and actionable. You'll need to know all three of those. Libel, defamation, and actionable. Um, okay, so now we're moving to that last chapter, chapter 10, when we talked about um, persuasive messages and persuasive messages in the digital age. So there's a few things we need to know about persuasive messages. First of all, they're unlimited today. We use them more and more. The volume and the reach of persuasive is just growing, growing, growing. It's not coming down, it's not limited, but it's growing. Um, the, they are very complex now, persuasive messages, and they're very personal. Um, those that are uh, good at writing persuasive messages, they definitely use those things that we looked at with those tweets. They use lots of flattery. Uh, they tapped into emotions um, uh, and uh, those types of things to in order to push hard to sell you know and to do those kind of things um, and everybody is using persuasive techniques so it's not just these bigger companies that have these dedicated sales teams and those are the ones that are using uh, the digital market and using persuasive messages Everybody is using persuasive messages out there in the digital world. Um, one way that you would not want to um, persuade people, um, you, you definitely want to show them what they could lose, right? You stand to lose this. Um, you could even make a very reasonable request. We talked about the importance of establishing good credibility. If you don't have credibility, how can you persuade someone to do something that you want them to do? Uh, but we never talked about, nor should you ever use fear to try to create like fear or panic. Now you can put a sense of urgency in someone when you're using persuasive, but you would never want to use a, a fear tactic where you actually are trying to incite fear in someone. Um, they have another one in here that you have to, um, again, go back to that three by three writing process. So Candace is writing a, pro a proposal for a board of directors that's requesting uh, her company to implement a wellness program. <coughs> so she's trying to persuade them. She wants her company to do this. And so um, it gives you uh, a list of four things and it wants to know what's the first thing she should do out of these four things, okay? So know what that first thing's gonna be when you're trying to persuade when you're writing. Um, we would call that an upflowing right we talked about downflowing persuasive and then we talked about upflowing so when it's coming down from management or when it's going up to management so that would be an upflowing one uh, another question again about the three by three writing process um, it, again wanting to know when we're writing this persuasive colton has analyzed his purpose and his audience and has considered how he will adapt his message to meet his audience's needs needs what should he do next according to that three by three so they ask you in a lot of different ways and a lot of applicable questions to make sure you're identifying still with that three by three writing process. So go back over it if you need to and review that. Um, uh, know that persuasive requests always focus on benefits, direct benefits. Um, There's another, which of the following sentences best motivates action in a persuasive message? So you're gonna read four persuasive messages and they want you to pick the one that best motivates someone to, to do what is being asked to do. Um, again, I can't give you those exact things, but just be able to identify a good persuasive message. Um, all right, we did talk quite a bit about when we were talking about that borderline of being even in, we talked about in negative writing and indirect <laughs> strategy, what's ethical, what's not. And then in persuasive, again, we talked about what kind of things start hitting that line of maybe we've crossed that line of being ethical. 
Uh, for example, one of the things we said you should never do is you should never exaggerate. Like, don't say, oh, this is going to save you thousands when you know it will only save them about $300 for the year, so, so to speak. So we talked about not exaggerating. What were some of the other things we said were not good to do when persuade, persuading? We talked about, um, not everybody at one time, <laughs> we talked about omitting information. That's unethical if you purposely leave specific things out. Uh, we talked about overemphasizing certain things. Um, and exaggerating. We talked about all of those things being unethical. Um, and then they can't just give you a definitional question. They also have to say which of the following is being unethical. So as long as you know those things are unethical, then you can judge on the next question knowing, okay, now I'm looking at these four examples, which one of these are not being very ethical. So they're either exaggerating a point or they're overemphasizing a certain thing or they're very specifically leaving something out. Um, why would we even worry about being ethical? What motivates us in the business world to be ethical? If we're not ethical, what's going to be damaged? Our credibility, our reputation. Um, uh, again, they go back, they want you to look and say, okay, which one of these situations would require indirect uh, organization um, instead of direct so just go back and hit that and make sure you know those um, we talked a lot when we were talking in the persuasion uh, chapter and about persuading about how these lines of authority remember are being blurred and it's going more to this uh, unilateral I feel like we did a pretty good job talking about that so I think you'd be able to recognize that question um, Uh, it gives you another situational. Adam's writing a proposal to the board of directors. Again, this would be upflowing about an idea for a new product line. Uh, what should he do to best persuade the members? So just, you know, go back and review that chapter about persuading and the things that we went over. Um, we talked about how you could, uh, some of the things you could do is reduce risk, right? Talk about their specific benefits. Um, there are a number of things in the PowerPoint that we talked about that would help people to have that buy-in. Um, when price is an obstacle, um, sometimes we can break that down and we talked about how you could put it into smaller units where it wasn't lying, but you could just show it in smaller increments and that might would help. And then I told you I would let you know the question on press releases. We just talked um, very quickly, but I said this is one that they always uh, like to ask uh, or say there was only one question on this particular test about pre uh, press releases and you just need to note that the best press releases focus on information that appeals to the target audience. That's the only question this time that they gave you on press releases. And we didn't spend a ton of time on those and we didn't do any class activities, so you just need to know that question. And that is it.